and um, telling us where you're from and, and what inspires you to be here today. On the chat, you can, you can always click on the chat and see what people are saying. All right, great. We're getting lots of people on the chat. A lot of hellos. Here from Washington, from California, Morocco, London, Seattle, South Hero. <laughs> so far away <laughs> from us. South Hero, just north of here. Lisbon, Argentina. We have, uh, is it worldwide? participation here is actually really exciting. We have, well, I'll tell you the statistics in a little bit, but we're very grateful for everyone to be here. And I guess we should start in a minute. We have 129 people in, and there's supposed to be 500 people in, so. Um, should we start? In a couple of minutes, John, what do you think? Yeah, let's start. We, I just bounced over to the YouTube page and there's 74 watching there. So we're up over 200 now. Yeah. And we are recording, so people can catch anything they missed. People from South Africa, Germany. Exciting, Burkina Faso. Awesome. Um, I think I might start soon, right? Okay, everyone. Um, thank you all for, for joining us today. Uh, we are extremely excited and moved by, by this high level of participation from people from all backgrounds and, and places from around the world. And, and we are just really happy to have you here. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is the Ecological Economics for All Summer Crash Course 2022. And we're focusing on the shift needed in economics to enable a just transition to a right size economy. We are very grateful for our co-sponsors, the leadership for the ECOSOIC, which is an international program between McGill University and the University of Vermont, the Gunn Institute for Environment, which is also our home here at the University of Vermont, um, Rethinking Economics, UVM. A lot of what, what, what we will be doing uh, during these four days is rethinking economics. So it, it fits a lot to be working with them and the International Society for Ecological Economics, uh, Democracy Collaborative, and the Bietersdorf Professorship in Sustainability Science and Policy. So here we go. So statistics, everyone, so we have a lot of economists here. So I'm sure you're gonna like these statistics. The global participation is very strong for our course. We have people from literally all continents. Um, there is, 856 of you who, who register through that form that I sent out and, and, and you're all human beings who I guess want to learn. I, I like how most of you clicked on that option as it shouldn't be shocking, right? Uh, we have 30% from North America and Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, we have 8% from South America, 36% from Europe, 6% from Africa, 18% from Asia, and I believe, I cannot see it here because I'm blocking it, but it's 2% from um, Oceania, which is mostly from Australia and New Zealand. And I do would like to uh, apologize and acknowledge that the time zone issue uh, is a little problematic for people in, <laughs> in Asia and, and Oceania. So I'm sure in other places too, but I still really, really appreciate people coming to our course and it's awesome. So what best describes you, I asked you this question on the registration form and, and we have overwhelmingly a lot of students and the graduate students, graduate students, postdocs, a lot of teachers, a lot of academics, uh, practitioners, activists, we have a lot of activists, private sector, public sector, 
and a bunch of hybrids. I like to call a lot of us wear different hats at different times. And a lot of you chose to describe yourselves as a, as a hybrid of a different uh, kind. And obviously most of you are human beings. So that's a good sign, um, but uh, it's great. And also I would like to point out, there's a lot of you who are actually economic students, also environmental students or academics, teachers, or people who just generally uh, interested in, 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 in understanding how the economy works so we can have a, a better, um, more just and sustainable planet for, for people and for the rest of nature. So that's great. So another question on, on the registration was, have you ever taken a, a course in economics? 76% uh, of you say yes and 24% of you say no. So we will be interested to know how what you will learn here today Im improves that understanding that you're already bringing in. The other question was, have you ever taken a course on pluralist or heterodox economics? Uh, most of you said no, 58%, and 37% of you say yes, 5% answer others, a lot of you were donut economics, uh, which, which in many ways is, is part of the, the pluralist way of, the way that that book was written actually was bringing in a lot of heterodox economics and grounding it on ecological economics, which is fascinating. Um, and I believe that's the last poll. So what's gonna be happening in the next four days is we're gonna be rethinking economics. Today is, is the theme of today is why do we need a socio-ecological paradigm shift in economics? Um, John Erickson will, 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 will start with a continuation of his recording that I hope most of you watch. And his chapter, chapter one of his, his, his upcoming book, The Progress um, Illusion. And then he will be followed up by Bengi Agbulut. I hope I'm not butchering her awesome name. Uh, and, and then we'll have a discussion and a Q&A with them. And I, I will continue to reiterate to please watch the video, the recordings that some of the, of the, of the presenters provided and to check out the readings and, and the website. Make good use of the website. There's a lot of great information there. We, we've been working really hard to put it all together. And like I said, we, we're trying to inspire you just like, by the way, that first video of Donella Meadows that we provided on, on how do we vision uh, sustainable systems and the future, um, which is so important now that there is a lot going on. Um, and yeah, and I guess I'm just gonna hand it over to John Erickson. Thank you so much, everyone. Great, thank you, Rigo. Uh, thanks everyone, thanks for joining us from all over the world. Um, Let's see, Rigo, you can stop sharing your screen and we'll just uh, have, a, have a discussion to kick things off. And thank you for, to Josh Farley and Bengi for joining us. Um, we, uh, yeah, the day, day one is about framing, right? How do we frame this needed shift? How, how we're proposing this shift as a just transition to a right-sized economy. And as the uh, first speaker, I'm always in danger of like walking over everybody else's talk. So I'm trying to take just a little subset of this question. Um, I teach at the University of Vermont here in the North, Northeastern United States. Um, and I just can't thank Rigo enough for organizing this summer course. Uh, Josh Farley and I have been managing a, uh, a graduate certificate in ecological economics for, I don't know how long Josh, a number of years now with uh, well into the hundreds of graduates in that program. So this is a part of a kind of rethinking, rebooting of that, that certificate to make it more globally available and not just to students registered at UVM, University of Vermont. Um, so uh, as Rigo said, I'm gonna draw a bit from a new book. Uh, I provided chapter one of that book uh, to registrants and also a short recording of a piece of that, of that book. Um, where I was reflecting on the, the classroom of the experience of framing in ecological economics with, with my undergraduate students. Uh, I hope that was useful. Um, this new book is called The Progress Illusion, Reclaiming Our Future from the Fairy Tale of Economics. So um, it's something that is sort of a reflection 
on a nearly 30 year career in ecological economics. It's hard to believe, but I've been calling myself an ecological economics economist for uh, over 25 years now since graduate school. And, and my career kind of, uh, this, this, this Josh and Bengi, we, we sort of um, mirror, if you will, the professionalization of the field, right? When it was sort of formalized in the late 80s, early 90s. And, Folks like us were meant to go to school and study ecological economics and read books and write papers and start departments and programs and graduate certificates. So the book is kind of a reflection on that, a very personal reflection. Um, and I make the argument, as I think we will be throughout this course, um, that we need to kind of return, if you will, to the roots of ecological economics, um, a return to, to various heterodox schools of economics that are aren't trying to kind of nibble away at the edges of the mainstream, but are actually proposing a completely new story, a completely new narrative, a, a repurposing, if you will, of the study of economics. Um, for us, it it's really starts with a return to a science-based story, like how does the economy work? And you'll be hearing a lot of that from Josh Farley's talk tomorrow, but also a return to a more equity-centered pathway forward. Um, and you'll be hearing about equity and, and centering equity throughout this four day short course. And increasingly, to me at least, ecological economics in a course like this is part of building a foundation for a social movement, a social movement to reclaim our, call it ancient, if you will, human earth relationship. So um, I'm gonna draw principally in, in my short time with you all today, um, from the fourth chapter of this book. The first three chapters kind of frames the rise of economics as a theory of everything. Um, the first chapter that I provided you all is on the education of an economist, kind of reflecting on like how I grew up in the go-go 80s and how I was told, you know, greed is good and go out there and make money and that's what's best for you and for the world. And I kind of pushed back on that through my early years in college. Um, the second chapter is about the ascension of economics, the self-proclaimed queen of the social sciences. And the third chapter is about growing what um, Carl Polanyi called a market society, right? Where we sort of reduce all social relations to this question of market exchange. Um, and that's where I wanna pick things up on that. Um, chapter four is called coming of age in the Econocene. So again, kind of reflecting on my own career um, and you know, on the last 50 years, I'm 52 years old, white male American, um, reflecting on kind of my experience of growing up in what I call Act Three, the third part, third wave of the Okanocene, right? A cultural epoch that really prioritizes economic relationship and economics. You might have heard the term, you might be more familiar with the term, the Anthropocene, right? This is this geological epoch that's been proposed, a human dominated geological period of Earth's history. The Econocene is kind of a subset of that, um, something that I was inspired by Richard Norgard's writing, one of the early founders of the field of ecological economics. So I wanna talk about that. I wanna talk about the Econocene coming of age or the kind of maturing of uh, the world economy, but I'm particularly coming from a very US perspective here, the US economy in this cultural epoch. Um, and then just a prelude, if this book comes out in the fall, I was hoping it would be out by this course, but it comes out this fall. Chapters five, six, and seven are about a new story, a new economics, and ultimately a new economy, right? Which those three themes we're really gonna be stressing throughout this four day journey together. So let me, let me pivot to this chapter on coming of age in the economy. Um, Rigo's always encouraged me to use slides, but I don't know about you, but I'm, Slides are great, I love slides, but you know, sometimes it's nice to take a break from blasting you all with slides. So that's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna talk. It's gonna be like a podcast in a way, right? So again, the Econocene is meant to kind of contrast with the Anthropocene, right? It's meant to be this sort of cultural epoch, at least that we've been embedded in heavily and influenced heavily here in the United States. Um, and I tell this story of this cultural narrative kind of in three acts, the reflection on my own family's journey. Um, you know, if I go back to my great grandparents, they were first and second generation immigrants from Europe. 
and they were kind of coming into to the U.S. experiment in the mid to late 1800s at the kind of tail end, if you will, or the beginnings of act one of the Econocene, right? This sort of prioritization of market relations. Um, they were coming from the so-called old world to the so-called new world and kind of coming from European enclosure to the U.S. to kind of enclose a slice of the pie themselves. Um, this was also a time in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s, where we saw a, a pretty big split in the field of economics um, between classical and neoclassical. I'm not going to talk about that split. Act two of the Econocene, right, is sort of a pendulum swinging through the different sides of that split, right, where, where economics is trying to become more of a social science and is using mathematics and, and becoming very, very atomistic and focused on the individual to the old roots of economics, classical economics, more as moral philosophy, more as using economics as a tool, as a means to an end, not as an end in and of itself. So I reflect on my grandparents' generation, right? The Roaring 20s that was then whiplashed by the Great Depression and then whiplashed again by World War II. And out of this period of the Econocene comes a kind of dedication to the gods of economics, to economists themselves, and to this holy grail that we now call gross domestic product. Uh, in the US, this was the baby boomer generation, right? And a new allegiance to consumerism and growing the economy. Act three, which is where I'm going to pick up the story, is the pendulum swings again, right? Um, the New Deal in the United States in the 1930s was a reaction to the Great Depression, a reaction to the Roaring Twenties, a reaction to the no holds bar version of economics that had kind of swept into our universities and our institutions and our governments. The pendulum swung back the other way to this sort of great society promise in the United States in the 1970s and 1960s an agenda that was then countered with the so-called neoliberal turn of the 80s, 70s and 80s, which is really kind of, as I view it, that kind of third part of the story of the economy that's defined in its kind of modern form and function of mainstream economics, neoclassical economics, and has become a kind of dominant neoliberal narrative. So from this Reflecting on the sort of my own family's roots in coming of age, my great grandparents coming of age in Act One, my grandparents and great and and grand my excuse me my great my grandparents and my parents coming of age in Act Two, and then myself born in 1969 really coming of age in Act Three this neoliberal term. Now Guardian Guardian columnist uh, George Mambiat describes neoliberalism that emerged in this period in the 1970s and 80s as a political movement. I want you, I want you to hang on to those words, right? Because we'll come back to it. As a political movement where citizens were cast as consumers, quote, whose democratic choices are best exercised by buying and selling, a process that rewards merit and punishes inefficiency. So Mambia goes on to describe this society of neoliberalism as being organized around a competitive market that, quote, ensures that everyone gets what they deserve, end quote. Now, neoliberalism is often conflated with other terms like neoconservatism, libertarianism, laissez-faire, market fundamentalism. To me, its distinguishing feature is the essence of the economy, right? It's the essence of economism what Nor Richard Norgard describes as the reduction of all social relations, and I would add environmental relations, to market logic. So the neoliberal turn of the 1970s, what it did is it fused a kind of libertarian politics and free market economics into one thing. And it created a kind of master narrative that I grew up in in the United States, right? going to grade school in the 70s, high school in the 80s, college in the 90s, uh, grad school in the 90s. Um, this master narrative view, at least US folks in, on the call, and I'm sure people around the world kind of know the narrative, right? Freedom is market choice. Free enterprise creates jobs. Regulations reduce choice and kill jobs. 
Government is inefficient and incompetent. Millionaires and billionaires earned what they produced. The poor and unemployed are lazy and deserve what they get. This was the master narrative of neoliberalism that I grew up with, especially in the 1980s, because the modern version of neoliberalism took the form of Reaganomics, a full merger of you get what you deserve politics with a vote with your dollars economics, tax cuts for the wealthy, deregulation of business and banks, slashes the social programs. These were the policy principles of what became known as Reaganomics. And I would argue we're still in that kind of long shadow of that era of the neoliberal turn. Reaganisms, right, became the economisms of my generation. Okay, so these are some direct quotes from Ronald Reagan. Quote, as government expands, liberty contracts. Quote, unemployment insurance is prepaid, prepaid vacation for freeloaders. Quote, the most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. And perhaps Reagan's kind of most ironic quote was, the best minds are not in government. If they were, business would steal them away. So this part of the book, I'm reflecting on Reagan's oratory as a product of a slow burn of a neoliberal movement in America. Well-funded, pro-business advocacy groups and think tanks had kind of patiently cultivated and promulgated this focused narrative over decades, really since the Great Depression era. So quick pivot here. I, I go on to explore the roots of this neoliberal turn as a narrative, but also as a social movement and show some of the research that's been done on kind of categorizing and quantifying the neoliberal turn as a social movement. It's framing of our economic lives, but for the purposes of our course, also the framing of our social and environmental relationships. It became the story of my generation. The story of my generation in the US is called Generation X. And we were sort of, you know, <laughs> described as this kind of rootless wandering generation until Reagan came along. And it became kind of the story of my life. In fact, it's a story that's infused right and left in the US context and the political spectrum. Um, when the uh, Bill Clinton campaign wrote in the war room on the wall, the economy stupid on the strategy board, right? We all kind of nodded our heads in unison. Yeah, yeah, the economy, that's, that's who we serve. We serve the economy. When uh, George W. Bush responded to the 9-11 terrorist attacks here in the US, with a plea to go shopping to save the economy, we pulled out our MasterCards and got to work. When uh, big oil funded climate economists preached the market will innovate and adapt, well, we just kept driving, flying and burning in the hopes of a technological saving. With nearly all human values reduced to economic logic, this kind of dream of the economy will be complete. So I, I use this in the book to kind of set up my own kind of thoughts on a new economy, a new economics, right? A new story. And turning back now to the story of ecological economics, the purpose of this four day course together, I reflect on the influence of this econocene econo narrative on this burgeoning field of ecological economics, okay? The field was kind of professionalized in the late 80s, early 90s with an international society, a journal, uh, meetings every two years, then regional societies, you know, and I was in grad school, Josh was in grad school at this time, and we were kind of drawn into this sort of idea of a new path, a new way, a new story. But the economy narrative has, uh, had its own influence on our field. And I kind of want to reflect on that a little bit before we pivot to what would, what would the new story be? Would it be a kind of return to some of those early objectives? Um, and I used the infamous, now infamous 1997 Nature paper to tell the story, the three, $33 trillion price tag of what the Earth's ecosystems 
are worth or provide to the economy. Because I was just finishing my PhD in 97 and the nature paper was like all the rage. And um, it represented a kind of pushing of the frontier of economic valuation, but also it represented a pretty significant split within the kind of early years of the professionalization of ecological economics. Um, and, I, and I reflect on this experience as a newly minted assistant professor of ecological economics. I think it was the first such position, at least in the US, at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. So I didn't realize actually the significance of the 1997 Nature Paper until November of the following year, 1998. Um, I attended, this is kind of you know, brand new PhD, first academic job. I attended with, with my own students, the fifth meeting of the International Society for Ecological Economics, which had convened in Santiago, Chile. And this question of pricing the planet was really at the center of a debate that was kind of pulling our new field apart. Um, ecological economics had been, as I mentioned, formally named and established just 10 years before as a distinctly different approach to economics. That's what drew me to this field. Not just a newer version of what we were trained at, at Cornell University in environmental economics, right? Which is all kinds of new tricks to put dollar values on nature. From the vantage point of ecology, the science of interactions between organisms and their biophysical environment, the economy was fundamentally embedded in and interdependent on the web of life. This was ecological economics. Economic growth had both benefits and costs as the new, as a kind of human defined subsystem grew into a biophysically determined whole system. Um, to us, finding the right size of the economy was prioritized over the efficiency of internal exchange between consumers and producers, as was the distribution of the economy's benefits and burdens. If we could therefore no longer count on the, a growing size of the pie to avoid kind of comparing each other's share, then simply voting with our dollars wasn't gonna cut it. So on one side of the, you know, here we are in Chile, international meeting, big arguments going on about this pricing the planet thing. Um, on one side of the pricing debate, we're, we're pragmatists, right? Folks like uh, my colleague, Bob Costanza, who later um, started the Gund Institute here at the University of Vermont. Um, Professor Costanza had worked tirelessly, right? To build the professional society launch a peer review journal, grab the attention of the international development profession. At this conference, sessions on valuing environmental assets easily had the most presentations. And mainstream economics had a visible influence on a conference program that was co-sponsored by the World Bank. So we got the attention of the mainstream, right? In the pragmatist view, um, all were welcome at the table, especially those in positions of power and influence. In fact, Maurice Strong, one of the world's most established at the time environmental diplomats, gave the opening keynote address. Uh, Strong was the founding director of the UN Environment Program in 1972. Um, he was the secretary general of the UN Conference on Environment and Development, AKA the Earth Summit in 1992. And his attendance and his keynote sent a clear signal that ecological economics had arrived, right? In the pragmatist view. Now, on the other side, ecological economics was held up as a movement to topple the mainstream, right? To take the science of social science seriously, to de-emphasize money in all aspects of our lives and enable the next phase, if you will, of human development based on balance, and resilience, not growth and greed. So some conference participants were asking if ecological economics had succumbed to the very worldview it set out to challenge. A European contingent there, a very vocal European contingent, had formed a regional society of their own to resist in part the growing influence of valuation on mainstreaming the, the field. 
They asked whether ecological economics had become just a small improvement on environmental economics, which was clearly a subdiscipline of economics, right? Another step, if you will, down the well-worn road of economism. Or did the field represent a genuine counter movement? That's the question for us even today, right? A counter movement to the neoliberal agenda that reduces all social and now ecological relations to market logic. So perhaps Maurice Strong's presence, the former oil executive turned global diplomat, signaled a kind of surrender, not victory. These were the things kind of going through our heads back in 97 or 98, I would dare to say some of similar debates that we're having today. So this was my first international conference, right? As a newly christened assistant professor of ecological economics. I was fresh out of grad school. I had joined John Gallaty and Sabine O'Hara at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, the oldest engineering college in the country, uh, the previous year to help launch the world's first PhD program in ecological economics. Uh, the city of Troy, where RPI is located in New York State, sat at the crosswater, crosswaters of the Hudson River and the Erie Canal. The very heart of America's Industrial Revolution, right? A perfect place to take on the full history and momentum of the economic orthodoxy. We saw our mission as tearing down the hyper-individualism and market fundamentalism of lots of isms, of neoliberalism. And with an international group of students in tow, Santiago provided kind of a daily reminder of what was at stake both in and outside the Capitals Convention Center. So I go on to reflect on that. I won't go into the details, but this was an interesting time to be at an international conference in Santiago. Um, and this was, I think, November of 98, longtime dictator Augusto Pinochet had been apprehended on human rights violation during a medical visit to London. And there were big protests in the streets and big rallies. And uh, this really was the kind of tail end, um, continued on past 98, but really the tail end of the most infamous experiment, I would claim, in neoliberalism that was led by the so-called Chicago boys. Um, so at our 1998 conference, right, the exuberant extension of market principles to price nature poured salt in the open wounds of this Northern imposed neoliberal assault on human life and dignity. Not surprisingly, the World Bank's interests in a Southern Ecological Economics Conference was met with a lot of skepticism, as was an expanding Northern-led research agenda on Southern ecosystem valuation. So looking back at that program, presentations such as North-South trade and carbon emissions, environmental services of Brazil's Amazon forest as a potential source of monetary flows. That's a presentation title. Uh, a, a presentation on valuing biodiversity, insights from the pharmaceutical industry. These sorts of presentations, which really dominated the conference program, were viewed as, by some at least, by neoliberalism in disguise. Those not bound by the economic faith were asking who was pricing the planet and for what purposes? They were asking, was ecological economics simply another justification for privatizing the, common, the commons, exploiting the poor, and reducing social relations to market transactions? Was the science and management of sustainability narrative, which was the theme of earlier conferences of ecological economics, was this science and management of sustainability just another wolf in sheep's clothing? So, I returned to RPI in 1998, you know, year one on the job, somewhat disenchanted with ecological economics. Um, and I was just hired to be a professor of ecological economics, right? My own questions about the state and fate of the field led me back to the future, as it were, in search of uh, foundational principles 
for the study of the economy rooted in ecology and ethics. Like, let me go back to those basic ideas. Um, at RPI, I was struggling to break free from my own economics training in service of a new generation of students looking for strategies to exit the econo scene, right? Not double down on its core market logic. The first batch of students that came to our fledgling PhD program um, came largely from Europe and from some alternative US schools where the neoliberal brainwashing of undergraduate education had yet to run its course. Um, some of these students have gone on to found programs of their own at places like Leeds and, and Vienna and Barcelona. And so, um, but they came to us, like we didn't have to deprogram them. They, they, they weren't brainwashed when they, when they landed at RPI. Um, some had science backgrounds, like my, my first doctoral student, uh, Evelyn Wright, had a master's in physics from Harvard. And she was approaching the isolated discipline of economics from a really fresh perspective, right? It's the science-based narrative. Um, all took a chance on RPI. This was late 90s. With a purpose of studying economics in some part as Keynes star student, Joan Robinson famously said, quote, not to acquire a set of ready-made answers to economic questions, but to learn how to avoid being deceived by economists. <laughs> and in some way or another, that's been my whole career, right? <laughs> to work with my own students to learn how to avoid being deceived by economists. Um, now, I had only started to unravel the, this deception a few years earlier in graduate school, right? Uh, I wasn't taught this, I had to go find it myself um, through the writings of, of an earlier generation. Um, I stumbled upon a book in a free book pile, which changed my life, a book by Herman Daly, a 1973 collection of essays called Toward a Steady State Economy. And it gave me a roadmap to both physical and ethical first principles, as Herman wrote, for economics. Um, Herman had assembled this kind of eclectic group of authors, including biologists like Stanford's Paul Ehrlich, who had made waves in 1968 with his best-selling book, The Population Bomb. Uh, theologians like John Cobb, who expanded ethics to the non-human community of life. And systems modelers like Danella Meadows and Jorgen Randers, who's the Limits to Growth Study in 1972, released the year before the 73 book, sent shockwaves around the world, a world trying to come to terms with the specter at that time of an OPEC oil embargo. I guess the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, in that book, and kind of what influenced me were fellow economists, right? Like Kenneth Boulding, E.F. Schumacher, Nicholas Georgeski Rogin. They were all in the mix. Uh, Boulding's 1966 essay, The Economics of the Coming Spaceship Earth, provided the goalposts for a new economics. Schumacher's 1968 essay on Buddhist economics opened the door to non-Western systems of thought. I, I was brainwashed with Western systems of thought, so I was hungry for something different. Um, an excerpt from Zerzeski's 1971 masterpiece on the entropy law and the economic problem turned the entire edifice of equilibrium economics that I had been taught in grad school on its head. Uh, even There was even in the book a section of the abolition of man, a 1944 uh, novel by British novelist C.S. Lewis. And it kind of rounded out the volume with a warning of the folly of humanity's perceived conquest of nature, setting the tone of humility in the face of uncertainty for early aspirations of an ecological economics. These hand-picked essays um, framed an emerging paradigm shift in political economy, a kind of purpose for today, right? To kick that off. What, what is the emerging paradigm shift in political economy? As Daly, Daly asserted this in the first sentence in his introductory essay, right? Referencing Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, 1962, Daly contrasted the day-to-day -day cumulative process of most science with the disruptive discoveries that occasionally arose to challenge conventional wisdom. 
in normal science, the established paradigm is rarely questioned. Those who do are often labeled as fringe, right? Including past heretics who insisted the earth was not the center of the universe, that the vast diversity of life was not created in a cosmological instant and that human economies cannot grow forever on a finite planet. So this back to the future moment for me, this return to the roots, roots of ecological economics that I'm sharing with you um, led to, in, in the book, I, I, I then reviewed Daly's career because his career kind of mirrors the form, formalization of this field of ecological economics, really defines these formative years and this tension between different visions of an ecological economics. Um, it overlapped considerably, influenced and was influenced by the sustainable development narrative, right? And a Southern-led backlash to neoliberalism. Um, I say later on that, you know, moving beyond growth, which was actually the theme of our meeting in Chile, 1998, moving beyond growth, was core to the early vision of ecological economics imagined by the field's founders. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, those raised on Galbraith's affluent society, Boulding's spaceship Earth, um, Elric's population bomb, Georgeski's entropy problem, Meadows' limits to growth, and Daly's own steady state economics. All of these perspectives were questioning, admittedly from a Western voice, questioning a Western narrative questioning the dogma of growthism. What was the purpose of growth? Who received the benefits and who paid the costs of growth? Does economic growth always and everywhere equate to human progress? And if not growth, then what? So the late stages of this work, right, overlapped with new people drawn to ecological economics, like myself, um, overlap my, with my own career. People like me started calling themselves ecologically economists, not even really knowing what that meant. Um, this was all happening during that kind of, you know, 30 year ago professionalization of the field. Um, I was just starting grad school in 1992 during the Earth Summit and five years after the Brundtland's Commission on Our Common Future. So it's here, checking my time, I'm in good, good shape. It's here that I wanna read just the last few pages of this chapter to help frame today's discussion and the days ahead. So here we go, 1992. <laughs> Sorry to be so historical here, but I feel like day one, if we don't root it in a kind of historical where we come from and where are we today, we might get a little lost. Um, so, when the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was opened for signature at the 1992 Earth Summit, it's worth noting that carbon dioxide levels at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii were at 356 parts per million, already above an accepted margin of safety for climate stability. I just looked this up in 2021, last year, Average annual atmospheric concentrations surpassed 414 parts per million with zero signs of leveling off. In fact, more than half of carbon pollution from the start of the industrial era, put it at 1750, through 2015, more than half of that carbon pollution was admitted after 1987, after the year of the Brundtland Commission. In other words, the tons of industrial carbon emitted in the 27 years after Brundtland equaled the total from the 237 years before. Let that sink in, okay? The impact of a growing human population with growing economic demands on the rest of life has been even more striking. The Convention on Biological Diversity which by the way, also opened for signature at the 1992 Earth Summit, doesn't get as much attention. Um, a multilateral treaty that all UN member states have, have since ratified with the exception of the United States. Despite the institution of 
national biodiversity strategies and action plans that we have from 191 of 196 parties to the convention, the lack of progress on conserving biodiversity is absolutely shocking, with or without the 1997 Nature Paper. Um, a 2019 global assessment by a UN panel combed over 15,000 scientific publications and a large body of indigenous and local knowledge concluding that, quote, around 1 million species already face extinction, many within decades, end quote. So just to put that into context, that's nearly one in nine species slated to vanish from the earth in a blink of a geological time. Draw a growing square inside a fixed circle, which you'll do tomorrow with Josh Farley. And the cause of this is obvious. As the global assessment found, two decades into the 21st century, 75% of the land surface is significantly altered. 66% of the ocean area is, is experiencing increasing cumulative impacts. And over 85% of wetlands area has already been lost. So I talk some more in the book about the sustainable development area, but Gro Brundtland, right? Uh, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister of, of Norway, who chaired the UN Commission. Gro Brunland was certainly correct in her forward to our common future, that development and environment are inseparable, but not in the direction she had hoped for the future. The Commission concluded that to achieve sustainable development, per capita incomes worldwide needed to grow at least 3% per year. That's an assumption that's baked into nearly every scenario that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change runs, 3% per year. And more like 5% in developing so-called developing economies of Asia, 5% in Latin America, and 6% in Africa and West Asia to have any impact on what they termed absolute poverty. They assume that a five to tenfold increase in economic activity in less than half a century would be made sustainable Sustainable development narrative would be made sustainable through technological advance to meet basic human needs while conserving natural resources. But again, the solution has been growth in a finite system all the same. Now, to be sure, progress on reducing the most extremes of poverty has been significant, although we've seen some dialing back of that progress uh, over the last three years. The World Bank proudly claims, quote, marked progress on reducing poverty, the first of the world's sustainable development goals over the past decades. Um, in fact, in 2015, 10% of the world's population under the World Bank definition lived on less than a global poverty line of $1.90 a day, down from nearly 36% in 1990, okay pat ourselves on the back, right? However, the unavoidable conclusion is that higher incomes in both rich and poor countries have led to more depletion, more pollution, and more extinction. Also, more time devoted to generating market income means less time for the so-called informal care economy, unpaid family and community activities that are foundational, I would argue, to human well-being. Now, if we're aspiring, I'll, I'll give this to you. If we're aspiring to $1.90 per day per person in the full expression of a market society, then perhaps there's enough planet to go around with some leftovers, some scraps for the rest of life. If success means more communities dependent on the, uh, dependent on the globalized economy controlled by narrow concentrated interests, then development is on the right track. Yet before Bruntland and ever since, the poverty math largely ignores the other end of the income spectrum, those with obscenely more than their fair share. To keep the growth model in play, incomes grow just enough to make life tolerable for the lowest rungs of the economic ladder. But no one at the top is expected to give an inch to make any room. 
As with any feudal system, the poor must instead be convinced that their fate is tied to further accumulation of the rich, be they nobility, clergy, or capitalists. As Cambridge economist Hajun Chang describes, quote, once poor people are persuaded that their poverty is their own fault, that whoever has made a lot of money must deserve it, and that they too could become rich if they tried hard enough. Life becomes easier for the rich. It's like Reaganisms all over again. Uh, the inconvenient truth, this is where I'll end, of truly sustainable development is that it can't be achieved solely by assuring necessities for the poor, but also by reducing the luxuries of the rich. If we recognize, this is the theme we'll come back to over and over again in the short course, if we recognize the physical limits of the planet, infinite economic growth is off the table as the solution to poverty. More efficient growth also falls short in the long run as resources become cheaper, cheaper, resulting in more depletion and pollution. In a zero-sum game, growth, can only alleviate the plight of the poor by limiting the glut of the rich. Yet Brundtland, the World Bank, the United Nations, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and every nation on the face of the earth approaches economic, social, and environmental crises with the same general solution, grow everything for everybody. As Donella Meadows put it, quote, the world's leaders are correctly fixated on economic growth as the answer to virtually all problems, but they're pushing it with all their might in the wrong direction, end quote. So I'm trying to be a little provocative here to give you some food for thought for questions. Um, I meant to kick things off. We're gonna hear from Bengi in a minute, and then we're gonna have a sort of joint Q&A session with you all. So get your questions fired up. I hope, I hope I've got the, the brain neurons sparking. Um, that's the kind of framing of the short course that we wanna challenge you with, right? Challenge the status quo, think about paradigm shifts. What would it take? Will it take a movement? Um, what would it take to orchestrate a just transition to a right-sized economy? Uh, we've kind of framed this challenge. Um, what perspectives and whose voices need to be at the table? I've got a lot to say about this, but I'm kind of leaving it off the table for now. Um, you'll hear more from Bengi about this, other kind of heterodox approaches to, to rethinking the economic problem. Um, what is the capacity of the human animal to cooperate and share in both the benefits and burdens of the next economy, of the next system? You'll hear some, of, I'm sure, from Josh about this from Lisi Crawl next week about this. What, this is what I hope we can come back to full circle by the end of this four days together. What are the critical ingredients to a social movement to get us up there? Because Lord knows we've tried it before and we'll keep trying it again. What will be different this time? What, what might that look like? So I'm right at 12.55, nice. <laughs> Rigo. That's it for me. Do we want to take a break before we go to Bengi? Um, thank you so much, John. Uh, that was a great introduction to our <laughs> course. Uh, I really appreciate that. And I, I really appreciate people commenting and you know giving their thoughts and also answering their questions, uh, which already we already have. I haven't been paying attention to that at all. So hopefully there's some good questions out there. <laughs> so yeah, please keep thinking about questions and yeah, take a little break of five minutes. Okay. We'll come back. Uh, feel free to Twitter, uh, use Twitter as well, and tweet about what, what's happening here, and let's share the information. As Josh would always say, we got to make it widely available for everyone, so we have this in, 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 increasing of, of, of sharing it and, and actually... I'll just say, if you're on the YouTube live stream, you can put questions there as well. We'll, we'll be looking we'll be yeah. over there as well. I've been, I've been talking with that one day, YouTube right. live stream. All right. Thank you.
Okay, hello everyone. We're back. Uh, Bengi, are you? Ready? <laughs> I'm okay. I'm I'm ready. Um, before I start, I mean, some of you know this already, but I'm COVID positive. I'm okay. I'm um, I'm uh, averagely functional. I think. <laughs> I want to apologize for having left my desk in the previous session a few times because I need to kind of hydrate all the time. Um, I didn't want to skip this, although I turned uh, positive because this is an amazing um, place to be. Um, and I think I'm going to. I'm, I think I'm going to be okay. So if I start babbling or like kind of just doze off. <laughs> Just um, apologies in, in advance, but um, <coughs> I hope everyone can hear me correctly. Uh, I will be sipping on my on my kind of lemon tea uh, quite a few times, um, but I want to uh, kind of start by thanking uh, Rigo, Aaron, uh, who's not here, but who kind of uh, was instrumental in getting me here. Uh, John and Josh to, uh, for, for inviting me here. Uh, I have collaborated with uh, all these people before and it's always been a pleasure. And um, what I'm going to do today will be a slightly different than what John did, but kind of complements it. And I think it also kind of resonates um, with things that he picks up in his book from what I've heard. Um, so I hope it's going to, I mean, it's going to be a slightly different take, but I hope uh, it will kind of provide food for thought for uh, especially the discussion. Uh, I also should probably highlight the fact that uh, my journey uh, in economics has been quite different than both John's and Josh's. Um, so I am an economist by training. I do although I am now an associate professor in the geography department, which kind of says a lot for kind of the future of heterodox economics or ecological economics in particular, where um, we find more space in, in disciplines outside of economics. But I did my PhD in a very particular school um, <coughs> at University of Massachusetts Amherst, which uh, had this heterodox uh, department dedicated to economics um, which was formed in, in um, early 1970s and uh, which was also kind of formed in conjunction with the social movements, especially the, uh, the student movement at the time, um, or let's say which was formed partly thanks to uh, the social and political movements at the time, uh, which was formed by Marxists, but has always kind of been a, a department that was radically open uh, to all heterodox approaches. So um, why we need a sh paradigm shift and how we can actually do it has always been a part of my training. Uh, also kind of the source of endless fighting within uh, UMass Econ. So, I mean, heterodox economists also fight within themselves about what to do it. But I think that's kind of the good thing about it, right? Kind of having this open, perhaps conflictual, but like kind of landscape of, of pluralism without trying to kind of uh, suppress that pluralism to one 
um, kind of school or approach to economics. <clears throat> so what I'm um, going to do today is, uh, or let me start with this. When uh, I was asked to kind of uh, to participate today, and I was told that the title of the um, of the panel was that why do we need a, a socio-ecological paradigm shift in economics? I immediately thought this is exactly the question I ask um, in the final exam to my to my students in my undergraduate seminar in a different way. But basically, I asked I asked the question. Um, my undergraduate seminar is called Economics for Sustainability, and after weeks of reading and discussing about the future, about how to do economics for a radically sustainable future, this question is never um, kind of super explicit in my course. So one of my final exam questions is, why does it matter? So why does it matter how we do economics? Because what we theorize, what we kind of model, what we assume about the real world does not, or how does that kind of have a direct bearing on the real world? So I kind of ask my question, my students to, to, um, to dwell on that. And I think they find it challenging, but I think they find it useful to think about this. But as they will uh, attest that the assumptions that we make about how individuals behave, the assumptions that we make about how social reality actually works, um, or the assumptions that we make about um, what actually constitutes what we call the economy has a direct bearing on the knowledge we produce and the knowledge we ask on, we um, we act on in changing social reality. So what is at stake is not only that um, mainstream economics or neoclassical theory is unrealistic or theorizes something uh, that is detached from how actually things are. But they actually, this knowledge shapes the world, uh, shapes us in different ways and shape uh, reality. So I'm going to kind of, in order to substantiate what I mean by this, I'm going to use three entry points and I'm actually going to, I forgot I had slides. And I know uh, some of you don't prefer slides, but I'm going to share my screen. And as you can see, um, my talk is somewhat ambitiously um, titled uh, A Paradigm Shift in Economics, Why, Where, and How. And I won't give answers to this, but I will kind of try to maybe say how not to do it or kind of uh, how we can think about some of these questions rather than kind of providing answers. And in kind of in doing this, I'm going to use, as I said, three entry points um, the assumptions about uh, what is the economy or how the economy as itself is, is defined in kind of mainstream economics, uh, assumption, behavioral assumptions, so in other words, how individuals behave, and um, kind of the nature of social reality, how does the world work. And in kind of doing, in, in kind of discussing these three entry points, I will, as John kind of said at the, at the end of his talk, I will draw upon other schools of, of thought in heterodox economics, and namely um, feminist economics most kind of heavily, but also institutional, old institutional economics. And um, I will kind of, in that sense, kind of try to locate ecological economics and its call and its project of shifting um, the paradigm in kind of, or the shifting the paradigm in economics together with these other projects that exist in other kind of schools of thought and how um, that could actually happen only if in collaboration or in kind of in alliance with all these kind of other heterodox projects. So uh, first, what is the economy? Um, so the mainstream kind of just, I mean, in a very kind of limited, um, summary of how neoclassical or let's say mainstream economics view what constitutes the economy is important because 
um, that it kind of it also defines what constitutes the realm of the study of the economy, right? What economics is supposed to study and what it's supposed to pay attention to. So Tim Mitchell, in a very kind of famous article, argues Tim Mitchell um, is not an economist, um, maybe thankfully, that what in, in an article titled Fixing the Economy, he kind of explains how these dominant representations of what the economy is, uh, representations through statistics, through indicators, through models, economic modeling, for instance, always is kind of dependent on or kind of concomitant to what is excluded outside of the study of the economy. And ecological and, and kind of mainstream economics looks at the economy only as kind of constituted by um, interactions between isolated individuals, uh, <laughs> voluntary interactions based on rational action under conditions of scarcity uh, within the market sphere, right? So just from kind of this definition, we can see that a lot of things are being excluded from the economy and representations of what the economy is and its study. And ecological economics has been very fundamental in kind of showing that this excludes an entire kind of biophysical system and the economy is biophysical. So um, th there was a discussion of externalities in the, in the kind of last session. Uh, so envirom the environment by kind of the mainstream is externalized to the economy. It's kind of only brought into the picture through the notion of externalities. But ecological economics is not the only school that kind of challenged this, per this perspective. And here I want to kind of I want to draw on the, the approach of feminist economics, which is quite uh, uh, a strong tradition within the heterodox school and that kind of a long tradition. And uh, feminists started debunking this notion of the economy and critiquing this notion of the economy by uh, underlining or emphasizing there's this huge domain of work and production and economic interaction um, that is not counted in this view of this kind of market centered or limited to the market interaction um, um, definition of, of uh, economics. So, um, and but by that I mean the unpaid labor and unpaid production of mostly women so paid um, for the unpaid production that goes on inside households, in uh, subsistence production, inside communities, uh, but not only kind of the human or women's work, but also nature's work. So the eco-feminists have been kind of uh, emphasizing the parallels between invisibilization in this kind of dominant representation of the economy of nature's work, which is kind of very well argued by the econ uh, ecological economists, plus, uh, but also women's work. <coughs> Feminist economists have, um, for instance, in particular, tried to revise uh, the gross domestic product to kind of give a view of uh, what um, this unpaid labor, uh, how much it is and how big it is and why Kind of it matters to to look at it uh, and they also i think kind of perhaps more fundamental than kind of the uh, revision revision of monetary indicators uh, they came up with these concepts that can capture a more holistic or kind of more comprehensive uh picture of the economy they came up with concepts such as work of reproductivity or meta-industrial labor that captures kind of a more holistic view of the kind of labor that goes inside our economies they also kind of building on this uh pointed to uh principles such as provisioning and sufficiency as alternatives to the dominant kind of values um, and behavioral traits that um, mainstream economics have been focusing on or have been kind of have modeled as like the human essence, which I will come to in a minute. Uh, okay, so this brings me to what do individuals do, my second kind of entry point. Uh, and why that is important for, so again, why does it matter um, in real life, how economists actually model individual behavior, right? So this is kind of 
uh, my final question to my to my students. So according to the neoclassical again model, and I'm being um, kind of somewhat ridiculously simplistic here, but um, individuals make choices rationally, and rationally in this case mean that they choose the thing that they that gives the most satisfaction to them, right? Which is kind of at this level kind of looks like it's a it's an okay enough kind of approximation, I think, of uh, individual behavior. <coughs> but what kind of comes with this kind of um, model are sometimes unspoken or most times unspoken uh, assumptions that kind of has to uphold this notion of rationality. Uh, I will only kind of highlight a few. One of them is what is formally called insatiability, which means humans always prefer more to less, right? The second one is kind of formally called continuity, uh, which means that when people are, if people people can always kind of trade off between the different things. So which means that if I have to consume or if I have to enjoy less of something, there is something else and there's a level of that something else that can always compensate for the loss of that thing. And the third one I want to highlight is that in the kind of core neoclassical model, preferences are taken to be exogenous, which means they do not change under any circumstances. So whether or not you're in a different cultural situation, whether or not you're in a different social context, whether or not you're in different institutional context, your preferences, which means the ranking of things that are of value to you would not change. So what does that mean? If you believe in this, um, or if you uphold this model of individual behavior, this underlying individual or model of individual behavior actually justifies first that a view of human well-being that is based on increased consumption right because of insatiability if you believe people always prefer more to less then you can be like okay people always so the only thing that i i kind of have to worry about is to get people to consume more uh this is coupled with what i called continuity which means that people there's always a level of another good that can compensate for the loss of one good, which means, for instance, that uh, economic growth, incessant economic growth is always good because it can always provide, because there's always a level of material consumption that will compensate for a loss of environmental quality, for instance, from the perspective of individual welfare. So these two kind of assumptions by the two of them kind of uphold this dominant view of human well-being and a dominant view that economic growth is the best way to provide for human well-being. Um, the third one, the exogeneity of preferences, then kind of imply that it doesn't matter. So that institutions and structures that people participate in do not change them. So they're only kind of that mechanisms of governance, structures of governance or institutions of decision-making, um, um, such as markets. So kind of decision-making through markets or mar market mimicking methods. By that, I mean, for instance, environmental valuation or cost-benefit analysis. These are methods of actually decision-making at a societal level by using kind of market methods. Um, so if you believe that people's values and preferences are not changing, then you would believe that these mechanisms are only and merely mechanisms of expressing preferences and values. Whereas if you think people also change their preferences and values and their kind of subjectivity change through participating in these institutions, you would be a little more careful about the design of institutions and how we make decisions. So this model of individual kind of has been debunked. Uh, again, I'm going to kind of draw upon first feminist economics and kind of institutional economics by these two kind of by other schools as well, but firstly by kind of feminist economics, uh, which challenge this idea of an isolated individual that only enter into transactions voluntarily. So this idea of a homo economicus, the economic 
man uh, is kind of portrays one that is not connected to anyone. There's no socialization. So the kind of this exogeneity of preferences actually imply that you interact with the society without being influenced, without being kind of, uh, without learning anything or without changing, uh, not dependent on anyone or not responsible for taking care of anyone, which was very, very far away from the reality of, of most women. Um, and they kind of started bringing in and challenging and expanding the, the boundaries of the discipline by pushing for a broader view of economic behavior and values such as empathy, altruism, and responsibility, which highlighted the kind of the connectedness and relationality of, of humans. Uh, and also highlighted the kind of uh, how individual choices could be not really motivated by welfare, kind of what kind of gives most satisfaction to someone, but by other, other considerations such as duty, obligation, responsibility, and commitment. So a lot of the care work, for instance, that women provide is not necessarily kind of based on a calculation of like what gives most, most satisfaction to them. And it's not necessarily voluntary. It comes from gendered socialization of um, all individuals. Um, and lastly, feminist economists have been kind of also um, kind of following up with that, um, challenging the notion of exogenous preferences and kind of looking at how um, preferences are formed through gendered processes of socialization. The second um, kind of school that I want to highlight is uh, the old institutional economics, which again, I'm only kind of highlighting one, um, a few points that they make in relation to the kind of the model of the human behavior. Um, and institutional economists have been arguing that um, institutions and social structures and institutions of decision making in particular are not neutral kind of mechanisms of just expressing uh, values and preferences, but they actually form and articulate environmental values and preferences. This is a point value articulating institutions is a, is a term that has been coined by the ecological economist Arild Watton, who argues that it, the institutions change the very logic by which actors perceive the problems faced. So um, different institutional contexts, because of this, also they favor different types of interactions and different kind of types of rationality. So institutional economists have, from the beginning, kind of challenged this idea that people have one kind of set of preferences. They said that people just act differently in different institutional contexts because institutional contexts give them the cues of what is appropriate to do, what would be rewarded, and they also kind of frame how the problem at hand should be solved. So whereas kind of markets um, or market mimicking, again, institutions of decision making would kind of tell us to prioritize self-interest, it would kind of frame the logic of that of solving that problem in kind of very individualist and, and isolated terms, uh, the community or kind of more deliberative context of decision making would kind of give us a different logic, right? It's a social problem. It's something that kind of we're interdependent on and we have to go about it by uh, not by kind of isolated self-interest by but we have to kind of uh, so it kind of reframes the problem in very different terms. So the second kind of point I want to make, which kind of is, I think, a hopeful point, is that there is no human essence per se. So we're not kind of essentially self-interested or like as much as we might think so, there are no kind of, um, I don't know, evil people who are like enemies of the nature out there because of the wrong values, right? So environmental values have co-evolved very much uh, with neoliberalism, with capitalism, with kind of growth-oriented colonial modern capitalism. Um, but um, this also kind of means that we can um, constitute, we can establish institutional contexts that can uphold and that can kind of um, proliferate different kinds of values. And the third point I want to make is, uh, about kind of the, the assumptions 
um, that are again uh, quite implicit in neoclassical mainstream economics about how does the world work. Um, and I'm glad John brought up uh, Richard Norgard because that was kind of the, that's the main uh, thinker I'm going to draw upon here. And Norgard kind of says that actually this kind of Newtonian worldview that dominates modern science, including neoclassical economics, is the source of our problems. It's the, this way of, of producing knowledge is uh, unfit to deal with um, challenges of sustainability. Um, and he, uh, Norgard, contrasts co-evolutionary thinking with Newtonian worldview. Um, and basically, I mean, this is a great uh, quote from him, the modern worldview and its incorporation in neoclassical economics has prevented us from observing, understanding, and acting upon frameworks which acknowledge we're inside the system we're trying to understand and change. So what does, I mean, again, as a, as a very kind of short summary, what does uh, Newtonian worldview, what does it mean for Norgard or mod, like this worldview that is encapsulated and embodied in modern science, including neoclassical economics? So modern worldview uh, claims that knowledge is objective. There's a knower that is kind of observing a reality out there, perceives and inter, interprets this, this reality without being affected by it. And people are kind of like this nowhere in the world that it's trying to know, or people versus the world are, are juxtaposed and they're assumed to exist independently from each other. So this is kind of a very particular notion of objectivity. Um, modern worldview is atomistic and it sees the whole made up of, of parts and parts can be known independent from each other. Um, and it's mechanistic. So it sees kind of the world as a mechanistic, uh, as, a, as a mechanistic entity um, where parts are integrated mechanistically. So how change in one part leads to a change in the whole can be known and predicted. So it's very strong kind of in terms of its claim to know. Um, and lastly, the according to Norgard, the aim of um, kind of Newton uh, modern science. Uh, or how kind of knowledge is understood in modern science is based on deriving universal characteristics, kind of universal causal mechanisms and predict and expanding predictability by uncovering these causal relationships. So just looking at the past or kind of current situation, deriving this knowledge in an atomistic and mechanistic way, and then kind of predicting future or kind of the claim to construct like what happened in the past. So this, as, as you might kind of already kind of imagine, uh, this kind of claim to, to universality of knowledge or this kind of claim to predictability and causality is only possible if you assume that what happened in the past will predict the future, which means that there won't be any kind of irreversibilities or, or um, there won't be any novelties in the future or that like there's no gap in your, in your knowledge about predicting the future. Which for Norgard is basically this approach is what kind of gets us into trouble or what got us into trouble. And um, as long as we go on uh, producing knowledge and kind of based on this perspective, this model, we won't be able to get out of this trouble. And uh, Norgard basically argues that neoclassical economics is kind of embodies this modern, this Newtonian worldview. It looks at kind of, for instance, it, it treats environmental systems as, as divisible and separable. It kind of under, it, it ignores uh, uncertainty and, and ignorance that pertains to the future or like the, the current kind of contemporary time. Um, it looks at kind of knowledge as if it's a linear thing. And uh, so I won't go into a lot of details, but what he argues uh, or what the co-evolutionary perspective argues in uh, as an alternative to this is, again, it's a lot more than this, but I wanna kind of highlight two things that also resonate again with feminist economics and institutional economics, old institutional economics. First of all, that co-evolutionary perspective starts with the acceptance that knowledge is not external to the systems we're trying to produce it from, it co-evolves with them, but it's 
which kind of also which means by by implication that it's never complete. So we're always kind of co-evolving with the system that is co-evolving and this system that is fundamentally marked with uncertainties and ignorance. Knowledge is never complete. Knowledge is always positioned. So we see and know from particular social positions, which um, then kind of leads co-evolutionary thinkers to say that it's always that diverse. And what we kind of have to do is to have as much kind of we have to democratize knowledge production as much as possible because everyone has a positioned knowledge of the phenomena at hand um and knowledge is always diverse and it's not a matter of the best knowledge kind of or most accurate that becomes rewarded or dominant so certain forms of knowledge do not become uh, dominant because they are correct, but sometimes they fit together with the system they're in. And as I said, this this is um, this is very much kind of close to feminist standpoint theories and feminist epistemologists' position about how knowledge is diverse, and that in order to actually improve the quality of knowledge production, we need to have diverse standpoints. So there is a lot of parallels between, again, feminist economics or feminist theory in general and this, this kind of, and the co-evolutionary perspective. And again, secondly, co-evolutionary perspective says that, I mean, the, what we're looking at is infinitely dynamic. So it's changing all the time. So notions like equilibria or kind of uh, like static change between equilibria, mechanistic change between equilibria that mainstream economists, economics uh, kind of use or build on in different ways, uh, we have to kind of get rid of that. And we'd rather, we should rather look at kind of how this change happens. Or, and also subsystems change and they affect each other as they change. And within this uncertainty and ignorance are, are fundamental. And here I kind of, I wanna highlight the, the, let's say parallels or the resonance with institutional economists and how they see institutions and individual preferences co-evolving with each other. So there's a lot of kind of, again, call for a shift uh, in paradigm or a paradigm shift in this sense. Um, there's a kind of an overlap and, and the productive dialogue, I feel like. So I wanna kind of highlight that um, from kind of the co-evolutionary perspective, a lot of ecological economists kind of find this not as kind of so the use this point that the kind of knowledge is never complete and it's always positioned and it's always changing to make a call to democratize, as I said, knowledge production. So certain decisions, especially decisions that are high stake and high uncertainty, they say should be made through kind of um, more democratic production of knowledge and that kind of made, made through the pers by involving the perspectives of other stakeholders that might not be inside kind of this expert knowledge production field. So um, for these ecological economists, the point of kind of improving our science is not trying to kind of uh, precisely kind of or pre precision or improving of predictability, but rather kind of making science more democratic. Uh, so the kind of the quality of the production of knowledge for them should be improved rather than its outcome. And that brings me to, to my kind of last point, how to shift the paradigm. Um, actually, I should have probably named this part, how not to shift the paradigm or, um, how the paradigm can be not shifted. I don't know. But um, what I wanna kind of make the point here is that I want us to all kind of think about the limits of trying to shift the paradigm from within economics. And I do believe in the value of work that we all do inside the discipline, trying to kind of subvert it, trying to push its boundaries. But on the other hand, the way that economics as a science has fit with kind of all these other social systems. Um, how neoclassical economics kind of, in a way I try to kind of explain that, how it justifies and underlies 
certain policies, certain institutional structures, and how it kind of justifies capitalism itself, it makes me question, and I think it should make all of us question, uh, how much we can change it without changing capitalism or like the systems that it underlies, underpins, and perpetuates. So um, John Robinson has said famously that economics itself has always been partly a vehicle for the ruling ideology of each period, as well as a part, as well as partly a method of scientific investigation. We don't have to be kind of super strict uh, about and say that economics is only ideological, but I think we all see how the current paradigm is uh, very much interlinked with perpetuating kind of the systems of oppression and kind of this growth oriented capitalism that we see around ourselves. So I think struggles to shift the paradigm in economics and within, from economics should um, always ally with social movements and struggles that are trying to shift the paradigm outside of economics, shift the social and the dominant socioeconomic systems we live in. And not only because these movements demand a different kind of knowledge, but also because the way that, that unless that world that the economics is trying to produce a knowledge is um, or justifying is changing, I think there is a limit to which we can shift the paradigm within it. And the second point I want to say <coughs> is actually inspired by this feminist economist, Drusilla Barker, uh, which was kind of in, his, in her reply to Tony Lawson, a famous critical realist, uh, who's whose work has criticized the positivism and the use of formal modeling in economics. And she was saying, um, yes, I mean, yes, economists use formal modeling, but they use it because it's a part of um, e economics is constructing itself as a science. So the use of formal modeling, the use of positivist methods have always been a part of mainstream economics claiming that it is science and it is kind of a science in the sense that it is that natural sciences or hard sciences are science. So I think a paradigm shift in also kind of in line with the co-evolutionary perspectives call for democratizing knowledge. It should go hand in hand with dethroning in a way economics as science, as a precise science and kind of democratizing economics and knowledges, other knowledges that create kind of that are on the economy and kind of validating them. So maybe it is not as much about changing the mainstream, but it is more about kind of making the fringes or the margins more valid and more valuable. Uh, and I'm going to end here because I don't think I have any voice left anymore. Thank you for listening. <coughs> Thank you so much, um, Mangi, for, for um for, for, for being here. I mean, the fact that you, you have COVID, I didn't know that you had COVID and, and you still decided to participate. I mean, that means you deserve all the admiration and respect from us because that, that takes a lot and I really appreciate it. I really hope that you, you have a speedy recovery and feel like new um, tomorrow. <laughs> well, I think I am getting better, but I also don't want to be super optimistic because there are also stories of first recovery and then getting worse, but... Um, yeah. We'll all hope that you will get better. Um, and thank you so much. So now I guess we can turn to a little bit of discussion and Q and A with, with between with between John Erickson and 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 uh, There are there are a lot of questions that you can also see them on the Q and A box. Uh, I might start with with one that that a lot of us ask ourselves. <laughs> when we you know begin the, this journey of, of trying to learn about ecological economics and it, i wish I, i'm not going to go into answering myself but basically colin asks what does it take to become an ecological economist how can those of us unwilling to do a phd program become an ecological economist or do we need that degree i think that's a very important question so who wants to take that first? Me? Okay. <clears throat> well, you went, you went to Amherst, so you've got all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> I 
That's a great uh, place to was like, I was actually going to <clears throat> quote Ben Fine, who's another kind of Marxist political economist who's at SOAS. And there was this, I don't remember if you, like maybe 10 years ago, there was this uh, compilation of like, they asked like maybe 100 heterodox economists to define like heterodox economists or say like three, they asked three and three questions. And one of Ben Fine's answers, I think one of the questions is like, where do you see the future of heterodox economists or economics going? Like there's departments or institutions. And he says, um, heterodox economics is alive and well. Uh, and it's surviving and thriving just outside of economics departments. So um, I think um, trying to get an ecological economics degree or um, kind of a heterodox degree or learn anything heterodox from an economics department at this point is is almost kind of impossible. I think we have to just like just like John and Josh are doing, I think like we have to I feel like we have to establish and kind of develop these interdisciplinary and kind of transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary spaces and but also kind of I feel that when you graduate from an interdisciplinary program it's hard to get a job as an academic so I think we need there's work to both kind of establish the spaces of that are outside of mainstream that can validate and create knowledge, but also change the institutions that we are in as already kind of as ecological economists employed in academia to uh, kind of to invalidate in a way the primacy of economics as a discipline and like start hiring, start publishing, start kind of forming um, our own institutions it's a long kind of I think it's a long journey um but as I said I think if you don't want to if you don't want um your diploma to say economist if you're not hung up on that I think you can become an ecological economist yeah there's so many ways to thank thank you Bang. that was great um there's so many ways to answer this question maybe I'll try a different approach um that that's more based on a critique of higher ed. I mean, I think <laughs> this knowledge coevolution that you talk about um, isn't like held within the walls of higher education, and and so much of what we do in ecological economics, I think, is problem based, place based, service oriented, bridging between activism and scholarship, and a lot of the, the most exciting work is happening outside of universities. To tell you the truth. So whatever you do, if you're studying at a university, you're going to a university, um, my advice is you partner with, with civil society, you partner with community-based organizations, you do, you do grassroots work on the ground that's about evaluating, consolidating, and shifting power. Um, that to me is the essence of a lot of reform that's happening within fields that's based on methods like participatory action research, multi-criteria analysis, really sort of diverse ways of bringing diverse perspectives to the table. This is sort of, I think, where ecological economics is moving. Rather, and, and ecological, to me, hopefully you got this from my talk, certainly is not a subdiscipline. It's not Q57 in the Journal of Economic Literature Classification. It's not a subdiscipline of economics. It really represents this kind of reform of alternative vision of rethink of the economy and so I, as itself is heterodox but partners with a lot of heterodox schools so that's one way to think of this is the like ecological economics is happening is vibrant in the spaces in between education institutions and civil society and and government in some respect places like vermont um Ecological economic, I think, is also therefore our approach, for example, over the last decade has been building ecological economics capacity, leadership, training, classes like this through partnerships. Um, you know, I was of a generation that thought, no, oh, we could go out and create departments and degrees and, you know, challenge the mainstream by, be, by playing kind of by their rules. I, I think that's, that's now that, that, the horses left the barn. I mean, it's happening in some places. You can go get a degree in legitimate ecological economics, but 
our partnership programs, for example, through the initiative between York University, McGill University, and UVM, plus another 20 plus partners, 80, 90 collaborators from around the world and create economics for the Anthropocene. That's an example, right, of sort of weaving together all of these voices, the heretics <laughs> in our various fields to kind of put together a new vision for the economy and the economy in service of humanity and humanity in service of the environment. You know, our economics for Anthropocene then moved into leadership for Decozoic because we sort of had this realization of that kind of narrowing of the Anthropocene dialogue and narrative and the need to kind of open it to new narratives that are saying, what do we want? <laughs> Not in defense of where we are, but what do we want? And how do we get there? And how do we create the kind of various leadership skills to get us there? That's to me the exciting part about ecological economics, heterodox economics more broadly um, as, a, as a social movement. So when you think of it as a social movement, it is not held in academics. It's really held in the state houses and streets and, um, and everywhere. I could blabber on, maybe we can. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, John Bengi. Uh, I, I'll just add, I can't resist, but I've the, my own input into this, the ecological economics for all initiative itself is about that. It's about basically taking this knowledge and giving it to all of you. So it doesn't matter what your background is, as long as you, it can help you to understand what is going on with the economy and how it impacts people and, 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 and the rest of nature. That's what we're all about. And that's why we're so happy to have you here. So by the way, Josh Farley will, will speak tomorrow and he did recommend, and, and you have one of the readings is how do you become, how to become an ecological economist by favor. He wrote this paper ten, a decade ago and, and you'll read about how the main three guiding things of ecological economists is that we care about nature, time and justice. And, but I gotta move on to another question. Uh, Lisa asked, can you talk a little bit about how the American narrative affecting global narratives based on, the based on its position as a global power um, has influenced the past century? Very easy question. I think that was for John to start towards the beginning. I can start on this one. Yeah, easy question. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, the American hegemony, however you want to frame it. Um, I mean, economics has been kind of the mouthpiece for a kind of distinctly American version of capitalism, a distinctly American version of colonialism, a distinctly American version of um, exploitation. Um, I think Bengi put it really, really well in that one quote you put up, Bengi, is, is like, you know, economics is created from the kind of life and times of the economists, right? And it's become such a dominant institution in the United States um, and the United States in this kind of, you know, perception as a super, you know, the last standing superpower. Economics has become the vehicle for that. Um, you know, when I was in grad school, you know, I was taught that this sort of neoclassical economics was the perfection of, how we think about economics, right? You don't need to think about the past. You don't need to read history because uh, what we do nowadays is better than the past. <laughs> and another free book I stumbled across was uh, John Kenneth Galbraith's book, Economics and Perspective. And he made the very simple point that economics always and everywhere comes from the life and times of the economists. And it was just kind of like a, so obvious, right? But it was like a moment for me. It's like, oh, <laughs> we, you know, we, you know, in the 80s, in Reagan economics and the kind of 90s and the Clinton era, like the economists and the economics departments and economics degrees and the journals and the societies were kind of in service of this worldview. So my fear is that many fields, some of the heterodox fields that you mentioned as well, have kind of you know had to play this game of like we got to play by the rules right we got to play by the rules of the ruling class we've got to kind of secretly build our new narrative of economics by doing things like um, like doubling down on 
dollar valuation, doubling down on cost benefit analysis, doubling down on the very things that we meant to push back on. That includes, you know, doubling down or, or moving against the rules of US, the US project, which has infiltrated our lives, our, our markets, our institutions, it's infiltrated places like higher education, I, I'm gonna. I can. I can continue to rant here, but <laughs> they're inseparable, right? The the economics worldview and the sort of vision of the U.S. vision of the economy are kind of inseparable, and um, that's right at the heart of where we need to push back. Bengi, I'm. I mean, your you you your your quote that you put up really sort of is at the heart of this, right? This co-evolutionary approach. Uh, yes, I mean, <clears throat> I think, I mean, I, I mean, in a way, like, and John referenced Hao Jun Chang, um, and one of like Hao Jun Chang's, the, the, this economist at Cambridge, um, and one kind of, I think, a significant part of his work, um, and he's like a more kind of an international trade macro guy, right, uh, is kind of to, um, kind of uncover this unspoken economic history where um, countries like the US who are kind of late comers to industrialization have uh, protected their economies and their industries. And then kind of when they developed, they pushed kind of these free trade policies to the rest of the kind of developing world. So um, I think like that's kind of a very fitting example of how economics have been kind of shaped in the image of American or, or US kind of um, US's insertion into the global economy and like how especially theories about international trade or comparative advantage have been shaped with the kind of the dominant um, like issue or the international order of the day. Um, but I think it's, it is beyond, like in a way, it is beyond the US. And um, I think starting to see, um, starting to see nodes of, of resistance and nodes of also kind of everyday economics that I see in the chat that like Katie wrote about how some of the best ecological economists that she knows is not in academia. So kind of a part of the, so that a part of the call for democratizing and kind of undoing this imperialism is kind of not, all, not only undoing the imperialism of US capitalism, but also the imperialism of economics as again, Ben Fine would say. So an economics as practiced institutionally in academia. So even in the, I mean, I went to UMass Amherst, UMass Amherst is in the US. So. Um, there are nodes of resistance and alternatives, not only in the US, but outside. So I think um, I think we know what to do and what to kind of support in this in this case. Yeah, Thank you. I might add, I mean, I reflect on exactly this in, in, in kind of the early chapters of the book. So that first chapter that I provided you all goes into the second chapter, which, which is the reflection on this kind of moment of Occupy Wall Street, because, um, you know, we all live in our bubbles, right? And when I went down to Occupy Wall Street and joined the folks down there, I was just, I was, I shouldn't have been, but I was shocked with the, the folks who were there articulating a kind of different worldview that I was like, this is what we've been talking about. Where, where are you people? Where have you been? Why don't I see this in the press? Why don't I see this in the news? Why don't I see this in other books, alternative narratives? All the narratives of the alternative are, are there. And it's the power structures, which is what this question is answering, asking, right? It's the power structures that suppress an alternative view. And it's worse than that because words like the S word in US institutions, socialism, um, when they're spoke, spoken right they're the kind of in hushed tones and it's just like it, it's like we've been so brainwashed and and our economic students have been so brainwashed and the million plus students who who take econ 101 in the u.s alone every year are being brainwashed right it's this indoctrination 
um, that has happened that um, we're pushing that back against, right? That are gonna, that's going to take a hell of a lot more than reforming higher education to do this. And I probably it probably largely won't come from higher education. It'll come from other places. Okay, um, that was great. Uh, there is there is a lot of questions. I'm trying to keep up here, but there is another <laughs> one uh, job, asking, "What do you think is the best way to shift the narrative away from a growth model?" So, what's the strategy that that you? Maybe your turn to go first. Okay, <laughs> that's a that's fair. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rigo. Did I did I interrupt you? Is there like a second part to the question? No, it was just a very simple question. What? Or how do you? How do we shift the narrative away from the growth model? Okay, I think there are a few ways, but um, <clears throat> I mean, kind of keeping in line with like what we've been discussing so far, that this shifts to whatever direction um, we want to take it. Um, needs to kind of come not only inside of institutionalized economics, but also kind of from outside or like give amplify the, the push from outside. And there are many, many movements who are questioning the growth imperative and who've been question, who question this growth imperative uh, forever. So since like all the kind of anti-colonial uh, struggles, kind of post-developmental struggles, and especially from Latin America. There are many communities that, are, I mean, starting from like the indigenous people's struggles in, in here in, in Turtle Island that question this, this growth narrative. So I think the most kind of, the kind of, the most forceful um, force <laughs> comes from, again, like outside of, of academia uh, outside of, of um, kind of us as economists. So, um, and, and I think they provide the knowledge on why growth is harmful to both human and non-human life, why growth is not the way that people wanna kind of live with or that that's not their understanding of, of well-being or living well together is kind of provided by, by the movement. So, I think there's enough kind of material to um, to kind of show that it's um, it is uh, it is not the paradigm like it is not the paradigm for most of the of the people in the world. But I mean, if we want to kind of shift, because like when you, when we say paradigm, it kind of think of both kind of the paradigm in which we live in, but also the paradigm in which we function as economists, right? But on the other, I mean, if we want to kind of shift the paradigm, and they are kind of sep they're not separate, but if we want to shift the paradigm in economics away from growth as well, I mean, we have to kind of, in institutions that we're in, we have to amplify the voices of both struggles and also kind of these heterodox economists who've been questioning um, the desirability of growth and the kind of the, also the ecological sustainability of growth. And I mean, one movement kind of both kind of academic scholarly and also kind of a social movement that does this is degrowth. So, um, so, I mean, I don't have an answer about how to do it, but I think kind of for me, most powerful is that, uh, is to join forces with uh, and produce the knowledge of and for social movements who already kind of are shifting the paradigm or like pushing the shift the paradigm away from growth. I would, John, so there's a similar question to that that maybe you wanna yeah. approach. Um, someone from the live stream is asked a little while ago, what's your advice for reframing GDP growth in high school, in a high school classroom as a teacher I need to teach the, the state standards, but I'm trying to shift more towards an ecological approach. So it's similar, but. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, well, I, I answered that question and, and those two questions and maybe first in the same way. Um, one is to point out again and again and again, 
that growth has not benefited the average citizen in places like the US that's promoting growth. So, so we first got to get away from this illusion. This is part of the progress illusion, right? That growth has created progress in places like the rich countries. It ain't true. <laughs> you know, if you want to measure progress as increasing, you know, some of the highest suicide rates in the world, um, some of the lowest access to health care, basic health care, if you want to measure progress by um, growing poverty and vulnerability, and living from paycheck to paycheck, the average American citizen ser serves the growth gods, right? But doesn't themselves benefit from growth. Um, the evidence in social and psychological research is enormous. So you have to ask who does, who's the growth model benefit, right? And I, I alluded this to the end of my talk, you know? I mean, if it really only benefits those in power and then we're kind of given the scraps and we're given kind of this um, treadmill that we have to always run to kind of try to keep up on, that's, that's how the growth model works. Um, so, so many of the talks I've given through the years that questions growth or critiques growth or leans into the degrowth narrative, right? The question I always get is, well, what about low income communities? What about low income countries? What about the places that need to grow to catch up? Do you really want to catch up to what the U.S. has produced? Do you really want to catch up and be more like a country that um, has a kind of unraveling society um, that is so that, you know, the kind of growth model has become kind of like a, a drug addiction for us. I would question that, that motive. And I'd question again, un and unpack and ask yourselves, how has growth benefited the rich countries? Um, now it's easy for me to say as a white male American, to sort of say, hey, you know, growth hasn't benefited us um, when clearly it's, it has benefited our kind of material, so-called material well-being. Um, but so much evidence shows that the costs of growth far outweigh the benefits. This is, you know, this is where ecological economics has made some great contributions around like the index of sustainable economic welfare, first proposed by, by Herman Daly and John Cobb. Um, the, more recent version of that, the genuine progress indicator. These are narratives that sort of still uh, attach themselves to welfare economics, kind of a bridge. And now, you know, they're bridging, I think, to broader narratives of well being that, as Bengi said, come from more ancient roots, from indigenous wisdoms, from really coming to terms with all of those non market aspects of our lives that survey after survey after survey say are more important to the average citizen and are being pushed out of our lives due to the growth economy. So again, I could go on about this, but um, the growth narrative is something that um, is a story and it's, got, it's a story that's told um, with, a, with a lot of uh, falsehoods built into it. Um, the high, the high school thing is great. I mean, I, I've, I've kind of given guest talks at our local high school here and um, students get it, right? They get that the, the social media and the, the consumerism and the kind of urge to buy and the advertising agency that's the advertising world that is completely designed to make you feel like shit about yourself so that you go buy stuff. They get that that's not the future that they want. So the degrowth narrative, the redefining growth narrative, the get off the growth train narrative, people want that. <laughs> and we're being told that they don't, right? We're being told that it's another form of kind of cultural imperialism by now saying, hey, we grew and you can't. Um, I disagree. Can I jump in back? Please, please. <laughs> and I've been looking at the chat too. And I think like th there's one thing that we kind of, I mean, there are many kind of good examples that are given in the chat about how to make kind of the costs of like, not only that the benefits of growth are not kind of, are not um, equally distributed across the globe or like within societies, but also that the cost, it is very costly in terms of human lives, non-human lives and kind of quality of life for everyone. 
but that is also kind of not equally distributed. But I, I mean, and like there are many indicators we can come up with that kind of try to dealing kind of well-being from growth. We can think of many ways to describe the impacts of growth. But I am afraid that we are kind of still being naive about like kind of if, if we produce kind of the accurate and appropriate knowledge laying bare how growth has kind of screwed us all that it's going to change and it's not this it's not that i mean i think that's part of like we're trying to kind of still play by the rules or play by the rules as if the knowledge is kind of a competitive market and that if we kind of produce the exact kind of we lay bare the kind of the awfulness of growth that is going to change it's not because growth is not pushed because it like that people believe, I mean, maybe it is kind of consented to because it is still kind of the dominant vision of like how, pro what progress is or like living well is, but it is pushed because it benefits very powerful economic and political interests. So as long, like if we cannot, so like growth requires an undemocratic economic and political system. So I think like even if like within the system we produce the knowledge and the indicators and the kind of the reports and the statistics it's not going to do anything i'm afraid or it's not going to do much as long as we we also kind of um we also attack the basis of growth in society and kind of like kind of think about why even like the like unions might be growth or like kind of consenting to to incessant growth or like why the working classes is, is kind of and it's not only I mean and consumerism is a big part of it but I think like the way that consumption is structurally coupled to production especially in advanced capitalism and kind of consumerism is over consumption is structurally coupled to overproduction in advanced capitalism through, for instance, plant obsolescence, as long, like we have to kind of attack the basis of production and like democratize and kind of put some social scrutiny over how production decisions are made too. So I think it's not enough to kind of just focus on consumption because they are not kind of separate from each other. Thank you both, that, that was great. Uh, I would just, um suggest again to check out the, the website and the Econ 101, we, we have a, an overview of the alternatives to GDP and that might be helpful to some of you. Also, there is somebody here asking, a, it's not a simple question at all. I think it, it says, how, how do you define well-being? And it seems to me, he says, um, Eric, to, to me that this is one of the many philosophical questions that are the root of, of of what economics produces. And, and I would just go ahead and ask the, the, the participants to, to maybe type in in their comment section, how do, what, 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 how do they define well-being in their own lives, right? What, what gives them this, this, this feeling of, of sufficiency, if you will, of, of well-being? Let us know while John or, or Ben <laughs> try to answer this question. How do we define well-being? <laughs> you want me to start? Okay. Um, well, I mean, I think that's like, that's why that's where kind of even like at that point, things start kind of getting tricky, right? I mean, how can we decide or like define what well being is for like everyone in a way? Um, and I'm going to maybe like cheat from the <laughs> kind of comments, which is, I mean, yes, we can think about kind of. <clears throat> certain certain basic needs and like certain felt needs not only basic but kind of felt needs to be to be covered but i mean kind of echoing some of the deep growth ideas that kind of we threw around and and um like and i am a deep growther and i'm a deep growth communist so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna hide anything but i think well-being is kind of as a principle is our like is kind of collective self-limitation in the sense of kind of living with sufficiency, where sufficiency is collectively defined, where we put limits on the minimum. So we, we collectively and democratically decide uh, what to provide to everyone in our societies. And then we put a limit to beyond, like beyond which we won't consume 
And we make this decision in a self-governing and self-determining manner. So for me, well-being is self-governance. Um, kind of self-governance with like with some kind of equity measures. Um, but it's also kind of like well-being also in a way kind of well-being is always necessarily mutual and kind of reciprocal for me. So it's kind of always looking out for the right to well-being of other species, of other kind of living beings and, and kind of um, nature. So uh, I cannot think of well-being in kind of technical terms and kind of independent from kind of this, this ability to self-define needs in a way. Yeah, maybe I'll just pick up on one thing that Bengi was emphasizing and, and use the word relational, right? So um, well, well-being has to sort of stem from relationships, um, which means economics is not well-designed, mainstream economics at least is well-designed to really think about well-being because economics as framed is anti-relational, right? I mean, it's framed as an isolated individual at a point in time. Um, and in fact, if you add relationships in the core economic model, the whole thing, the whole thing falls apart. You can't have this sort of equilibrium based economic model of welfare, which is equated with well-being, work <laughs> if people are allowed to care about each other. Doesn't work. <laughs> Someone was asking about the math. The math doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, economics stands on this sort of mathematical framework, right? It doesn't work if you allow interpersonal utility. And full stop. So as soon as you get into relational views, relationships between each other, relationships within family, within communities, relationships between human and non-human, um, economics as taught, as written about, as baked into our our textbooks and policy doesn't work. So this is really about recasting um, and rethinking economics and economy in service of well-being. So I don't think we have to kind of in ecological economics or any other brand of economics sort of come up with all by ourselves our own version of well-being. It's more of how does the economy informal and formal service act in service to humanity and humanity in service to all of life. That's as close as I can get. Um, this is why I think my own work in genuine progress indicator is insufficient, right? Because it's still trapped in a kind of well for economics frame of price times quantity, highly individualistic, more GPIs better than less. Um, that, that and that kind of Herman's work on, on economic growth, right? Is only part of, part of the answer. It's certainly, it doesn't get us far enough, but uh, economy and service to something else, um, relationships and service to the whole, to the collective, is as close as I can get to really reframing the well-being conversation. Thank, thank, thank you for that. Uh, I would just add again that, you know, we have, we try to look at this with energy, right? And, and there's been work also with, Max Neef did work in Chile a long time ago about the threshold hypothesis, which has been a pillar of understanding ecological economics, this threshold that, that we find where the more growth you get, maybe it can harm not only the society, societal well-being, but the environmental well-being. And the same thing with energy. You know, the United States consuming 300 gigajoules, uh, which means is a, a, lot of, a lot of oil, and compared to other European countries that consume half of it, 150, and then you have Costa Rica that consumes way less than Europe and is able to provide all these services to their people. And so we, we will, you can learn more about that on the website as well. Um, another related question from, well, from the, from the live stream is uh, maybe to Bengi, how do we work with, within existing institutions? Uh, we have, she says, we have no time for full systemic change to limit climate change? Can we use green growth as a gateway to introduce sufficiency in this course? That's an interesting question. Uh, <clears throat> I think, yes, we don't have time 
uh, from, I mean, I think time, time and like is an urgent issue, but um, I also think the time constraint makes it more urgent that we push for more radical solutions than the more kind of acceptable solutions. Um, there are many, many scholars, uh, not only kind of from kind of, let's say, degrowth scholars, but also kind of others who've been, who show that like green growth is not gonna, is not gonna cut it. And it's actually going to make it, um, I mean, I mean, from kind of a, from a biophysical perspective, it's not going to cut it. Um, there's been kind of a huge debate between degrowth and green growth and kind of using both empirical kind of evidence, but also um, kind of future projections that it's not the way. And um, I mean, but I, I can kind of see why kind of green growth is more maybe attractive because a radical change in the economy seems unlikely to happen in su such a short time. But I think, I mean, when we look at it from the other side, if we kind of push for green growth, which is also already kind of a compromise agenda, it is going to kind of keep producing um, ecological impacts that will take us closer to uh, planetary limits that will make the kind of ecosystems a lot more vulnerable and will make it even harder for us to kind of then clean up our mess. I think the time constraint makes it even more urgent and important that we push for something more radical. And I mean, when you look at, I mean, and, and kind of, I think the way to go about it is at least like some of the discussions that we're having in, 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 in here in Jojake, Montreal, with um, this group Front Common for, uh, for Transition Energetic, which is um, kind of a common front for, for energetic transition, about kind of how to de-link kind of the support for economic growth or green growth from kind of their social basis, basically. And uh, I think there, again, kind of this is coming back to like how to shift the paradigm away from, from growth. But I think there is work to be done for us, especially kind of economists and scholars and economists, institutional or not, uh, to like to strategize and to kind of really de like delineate the basis of support in our societies for growth. And, at times and most of the time by groups that are mostly that are most negatively affected by growth so i think there is like work to be done in terms of building alliances against growth and against green growth and i think um like continued green growth or continued growth whether it's like dubbed green or or not um i think that's like that's the disaster i think the kind of the urgency is is like that we don't settle for like the commonsensical and we settle for, for the radical. And like the, I, um, Lola Seaton had this piece in, in New Left Review a few years ago about kind of, kind of debunking this idea that um, this time urgency is, or like the, the ideas that are very radical are not kind of likely to happen. And that's why like the left should not kind of push for, for radical ideas, but kind of compromise. And she's saying like, no, I mean, we should push for the radical and kind of, because that has, like when we push enough for the radical, the common sense for the society will also change. Uh, if we shoot for, big, for green growth, it's likely that we'll even like land somewhere less than green growth. And that's like even worse. So I think we have to, we have to go for something more radical and like more drastic than uh, than green growth. Here, here. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I so many ways to answer this question. I at first I agree with Bengi. Um, I, I, I writ, wrote and directed and produced this film called uh, "Waking the Sleeping Giant" at the kind of height of the. The craziness in the U.S. in the 2016 political season, and um, really trying to kind of document the emergence of a new progressive movement in the U.S. Um, that certainly here in Vermont, Senator Sanders was a part of, and 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 wrestling with this myself, um, 
and I wrestled with this throughout the book, right? To what extent do we have to sort of accept, accept working with the current institutions in kind of so-called pragmatic fashion? To what extent do we sort of shouldn't accept these slippery slope arguments, um, for example, around ecosystem valuation and uh, push for and enable the more radical views of change and I, I honestly, I take issue with the form radical, like, and Josh is really good on this. You know, Josh is often saying that <laughs> what's more radical, right? Accepting kind of complete climate disruption and, and the sixth extinction um, or, um, you know, moving towards a, a view that's more harmonious uh, between people and planet. Um, I, I sort of late in the game of writing this book, I stumbled into this idea and I should have discovered it sooner, but I, I, I'm thankful for Julian Larson, one of our graduate students pointing this out to me, this notion of radical pragmatism, of trying to kind of thread the needle, if you will, like, yes, there are short-term pragmatic things that we can be doing now, every day, all the time, very much within the current system, while we enable and build for the kind of radical institutional change that's required. Um, and Jolene pointed out to me this, this article that I discovered again late in writing the book that I leaned on a lot in my last chapter. And it was written at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic by uh, Jeffrey Gertz and, and Homi Karas of the Brookings Institution. And they described the radical pragmatism as a willingness to try whatever works, guided by an experimental mindset a commitment to empiricism and measuring results. So again, this is like threading the needle, right? I mean, we, we can we can demonstrate that these ideas aren't all that radical and result in, in outcomes that most people want. So in this sense, um, pragmatism is about defining concrete problems and then ask what needs to be done, by whom and by when to make progress. This to me is the agenda setting process of ecological economics. Um, radical in this sense implies that an honest assessment of problems will often demand radical shifts from the status quo. I think maybe you're getting that from this first session, right? And while people often um, try whatever works during a crisis, be it the 2019-2010 global recession, the COVID-19 crisis, the climate change crisis. When people often try whatever works during a crisis, this approach can also be used to change systems proactively. So I wrestle with this a lot, right? Do we, are we sort of building the alternative in anticipation of crises, in anticipation of the crash, anticipation of picking up the pieces? Or are we, community by community applying the alternative now in a kind of next systems approach and, and, and trying these ideas now and collecting these alternative stories that if you look, they are everywhere. <laughs> um, one of the partners for our work here at the University of Vermont and McGill Universities is, is the Next Systems Project. And they're oriented around telling the stories now of the next system that are happening all around us. And, and telling those stories in order to kind of um, expand out and up, right? In order to kind of rethink the dominant systems, the dominant narratives by telling the story of the next system. Um, these, these things like the degrowth movement, they're not just like dreams. They're not just like, you know, imaginaries that um, are often some distant never, never land. They're happening now, <laughs> everywhere. Um, you just have to kind of get out from underneath the, the, the wet rag of neoliberalism, for example, to see, to see that they're all around us. I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, Poor Josh is sitting here in this conversation, John. just very politely sitting on his hands because well, I, I know he has so much. What? Josh, do you have a thought about that on, 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 on? Well, maybe the we, next question. Okay, the so, Josh floodgate? <laughs> yeah, the, the next question was asked by Ines, and I think is again they're questioning growth, and she she asked, 
What do you think about about target 8.1 of the SDGs, mm. sustainable economic growth, which says sustain per capita economic growth in accordance with national circumstances, and in particular at least seven percent uh, gross domestic product growth per year in a, in least developed countries. Does this make sense since we are talking about less, least developing countries, um, developed countries, or is this just more GDP? watching um did you have, respond to that i always have stuff to say uh, but uh, okay. i've been politely <laughs> deferring <laughs> i mean i would really quickly if i was going to answer that one i would say you know and this is what i ask my students i have 100 students in a classroom i say what's your average height and what happens if you add the richest person in the world the average height barely moves i say what's your average family income if you add the richest person in the world none of your family incomes matter. It's the same thing with GDP growth. If we're pursuing growth, it tells us nothing about the well-being of the individual. And in fact, growth these days is a better measure of cost than of benefits because the costs of growth are collective. We all feel. The benefits are increasingly concentrated among just a few. And it tells us absolutely nothing about the well-being of the masses. If we change our goals to say that, you know, uh, what we want is, um, you know, uh, health, uh, happiness, well-being, all of these things are we should target. I use the example of the U.S. healthcare system as an example. If we're looking at GDP, we have the best healthcare system in the world. 20% of the highest per capita GDP almost is spent on healthcare, but we have the worst outcomes. So if you're pursuing growth and you're basically saying, let's measure our healthcare system based on how much we spend rather than the benefits we get. And I could, I could go on and on at I didn't find them, but I'll shut up. <laughs> this can is I, a taste of tomorrow, so don't don't miss tomorrow. You're getting a little taste. Can Sorry, I jump maybe. in? Yeah. I, I will make more of a specific point, but because it's kind of come up with like the in the in the in a way in the comments, and I love Joshua's kind of <laughs> animated and passionate <laughs> passionate points. Um, I mean, I'm I'm very very critical of the sustainable development goals. This has come up with um, like in the ecological economics plenary session on uh, that Josh had, had co-organized last summer. Uh, this has come up as a question there. I mean, Ashish Kotari, whom you will be having in a few days, has written, like recently has written with co Walters a really good takedown of it, uh, of the SDGs. And not only because of the kind of growth kind of, uh, like not only the growth objective being incompatible with the other SDGs and like that it's unsustainable, but also the way that it kind of, it would feel like green capitalism and what kind of, kind of how capital would flow into kind of which parts of, of the world and which sectors the capital would flow into and what kind of commodification and, and dispossession waves it would lead to. But the point I want to make is, I think it is a, I think it is the most, kind of, I don't know, it's the most enraging thing to me to say that the only way for LDCs or like the developing world or the global South to, to kind of, to achieve well-being or kind of at some level of whatever we define well-being as is grow, is a, is a gross disrespect. I mean, this is first of all saying that, um, I mean, it, like even, and when it comes from the left, I find it really curious. So we don't wanna change the system that creates this inequality and like we don't want to kind of radically uh challenge kind of the inequality between the global north and south and like kind of by maybe some kind of a redistribution um or kind of we don't want to push the north to pay for its ecological debt uh or colonial debt and or colonial debt or care debts uh, kind of earth care that to the north, to the south, but we want to say, hey, we don't want to change anything. We don't want to change the way the pie is divided, but we're going to just kind of increase the size of the pie so that the south can get a little more and kind of, so the only way to address questions of deprivation, poverty, or inequality in the south is not through growth. There can be a radical redistribution and a radical redistribution of living within the limits and not growing to do that. So we don't have to resort to growth, but no one wants to talk about that. No one wants to say we're going to make North pay for uh, the well-being of the South. We want to say they they only want to say, okay, we're going to keep what North is doing, but like the South should can grow more. So I think that kind of takes us away from like the more 
kind of questions about historical and contemporary power dynamics. So the second thing is, Josh, as Josh said, the cost of growth is kind of more public than the benefits of it, but it's still not equally distributed. So even if we have growth in the South, that's gonna kind of that's gonna have effects, and that's gonna have effects unequally on the peoples of the South. So the South is not a homogeneous homogeneous group of people. They're not gonna all be so growth will come with effects, and like that, the cost of that growth in the South will fall on the shoulders of the people who are already marginalized in the South. So uh, that's gonna be like so. I kind I think. Like if you want to talk about even like achieving well-being and that kind of and and kind of achieving a decent level of of living standard for the for the people of the global south, um, the growth is not the only question. There is enough also knowledge and kind of work that is produced from the south on kind of solutions outside of growth. So let's kind of think outside of kind of. 7% growth is the only solution for the South kind of uh, framework. I, I would just add, um, I really appreciate that. I, we, have been, we, have, we have been thinking a lot about that. And in, in my paper that you will be reading tomorrow about the Biophysical Foundation, we briefly towards the end discuss literally that exact same issue with, the, with ZGA. And we got a little of criticism from, by saying that uh, developing countries don't necessarily need to be focusing on more growth, but um, we should have added, and now I understand this more years later, that we need to shift from quantitative to qualitative growth, and hopefully more of that will be discussed on, on, the, on the 12th. But there's another very fascinating question that I think you guys would like to answer. The person was asking if there's a lot of theoretical aspects in ecological economics, and she says, we're running out of time. It's a lot of theory that we talk a lot, and there's a lot of great things that we can we can learn from. But if we're running out of time, how can we actually apply those things to make change happen? And I apologize for reading <laughs> the question. Uh, okay, I'll jump in. Um, I think I'm gonna like just pass out like in five minutes. <laughs> so I feel like I'm like high energy, high, loud and like kind of blabbing anyway. Um, so first I wanna kind of tell everyone you might already be aware of this, but like uh, a group in University of Barcelona, uh, Autonoma had uh, actually through like a project they've done in, in kind of in 2010s, um, they, um, they compiled this book called Ecological Economics from Ground Up. So what basically this book does is kind of to work with, so the groups from the, the researchers from University of Autonoma Barcelona um, was working with kind of struggles on the ground, ecological struggles on the ground and kind of collaborating and kind of seeing how actually some of these struggles and narratives, the discourses and the tools that they use in kind of struggling, how it kind of, coincides or, or kind of mobilizing tools of ecological economics. So in ways that they might be, for instance, bringing up kind of the co-evolutionary perspective without actually naming it co-evolutionary perspective, or maybe they are kind of asking for or, deep, or pushing for kind of a democratization of the decision-making on a particular project uh, by using kind of multiple criteria other than cost-benefit analysis, which kind of falls in line with like the ecological economics, like the tools that ecological economics um, proposes for decision-making on issues like this. So that's one kind of particular and concrete way in which I think like ecological economics tools are actually being used to change the world, maybe in a more grassroots level, but um, I think there is like, that is kind of one way to go forward. The second way that I kind of find, I find, and I kind of my work and my politics lie in is I think that the main kind of theoretic, and I know both John and Josh have heard this before, but it's going to be a repetition, but the main theoretical tenets and kind of the pre-analytical vision for ecological economics, for me, I think makes a very, very strong case for democratizing economic decision-making. So uh, the kind of both kind of 
the okay, in line with the co-evolutionary perspective that like that uncertainty and ignorance are fundamental principles that govern or fundamental features that govern the ecosystem processes and kind of the economy. The fact that ecological economics kind of uh, makes the case that the environment is an interdependent and uh, good, let's say nature is interdependent. So what I do, what anyone does kind of has implications on everyone else. Uh, the ecological economics is kind of case about valuing commensurability. All these tenets make actually kind of the case that decision making in the economic sphere should be democratic in order to be ecological. So I think ecological economics actually gives us a way to uh, join these kind of like it's not it's not kind of um, join different struggles and different kind of movements to democratize and make um, democratize the economy and make it more just and kind of making it ecological. So I think there's a very strong ecological case to make economic decision making democratic. And I think that can find place in different scales of struggles and institutions that can be pushed for. So this is one way I think for me, ecological economics has, has provided the tools for pushing for concrete change. Yeah, I mean, building from that, um, thank you so much. That's, that's just so perfect. Um, ecological economics to me is, is, is more process oriented than outcome oriented. Ecological economics to me is, is a, about the deliberative democratization of work, of wealth, of ownership. Um, it's ecological economics to me is about um, planning for the economy that we want, right? Um, it's about working at scales of watersheds, food sheds, increasingly energy sheds. This is some work we're doing at the University of Vermont now on sort of defining an energy shed concept as a way to engage in communities in the transition to renewable energy and the decarbonization of society, right? To engage in democracies and democratic decision making in order to define our collective futures versus kind of greening capitalism, for example. So if you think about the shift to renewables, we can do this in a way that sort of just leverages capital markets, pays for the kind of industrialization of, of energy systems in a new direction, uh, concentrate your ownership of wind and solar and geothermal kind of in a business as usual strategy, right? Or we can use this shift to renewables as a way to democratize energy systems, democratize energy ownership, turn rate payers into shareholders, right? Um, these, are, these are the kinds of experiments that we're trying here in Vermont, as we see the classic rural urban tensions over energy systems emerge. And to sort of, as we see the kind of roots of nimbyism, not my backyard, come from the question of who benefits, who's benefiting from renewable energy versus who's paying the cost. So yes to democratization of, of economic choices, yes to democratization of economic inputs and outputs, yes to democratization in order to share more justly in both the costs and benefits of the economy, what, what Josh pointed to, right? Um, what, what we've seen, and I think what, what we're sort of pushing against is the concentration of benefits and, and essentially the democratization of costs, right? Um, I mean, this, this was at the root of our, of our film, Waking the Sleeping Giant, this kind of recognition across communities across the U.S. as we sort of sent film, film, crews, film, film crews to, I think, 20 of the 50 states. People were saying... <laughs> The benefits are in the hands of the few and the costs are spread across the, the backs of the many. If ecological economics or heterodox approaches to economics doesn't first and foremost recognize that and doesn't, isn't a part of a resistance to that, then I, I don't know what it is. Yeah, um, thanks a lot. We have 10 minutes left of q and I wanna give a little break to Wenge to recover her voice, but Sarah is asking, I'd love to hear more about uh, from John about practically what measures and policies. You know, people want, everyone wants the, 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 the guide, the specific guide. What can we do to 
to address what we're trying to address and because much of the of the wealth is being hoarded at the top she asks uh okay well so, so many ways to take that i mean again democratization of all this is going to mean that multiple voices and multiple perspectives and multiple stakeholders are going to tell us the way forward right and um you know, my, my editor, Ireland Press, was like, okay, last chapter, give us the give us the steps to take, give us the recipe, tell us what to do. You know, and I was like, ah, here we go. Another white guy gets to tell you what to do, right? And I, was, and I really, really, really resisted that. Again, sort of imagining a more process-oriented kind of view of the economy going forward. Um, but again, I mean, you, you can kind of collect examples, collect stories, collect the alternatives, and the alternatives are all around us. Whether it's the democratization of wealth, the democratization of work, the democratization of energy, um, these are the kind of alternatives and steps forward that are being tried everywhere. Um, you know, I, I, I think, for example, in my own work, I have advocated in Vermont for a carbon tax for changing the incentives on the demand side of the energy equation, right? Knowing full well that that's not enough. Um, Bill McKibben says we need silver buckshot, not silver bullets. Um, so that's maybe one kernel, right? Is to change the, the landscape of the incentives that businesses and households are reacting to is to change the price of energy. But the faster, way to change our energy system, for example, is through supply side constraints, through supply side management, through, for example, um, restrictions to um, new energy systems that rely on fossil fuels. Um, this is going to be faster and fairer than just simply tweaking the demand side and hope that if we vote with our dollars, we'll get the new energy systems that we need. And again, we're seeing this just in the context of the US happen across the country, right? As communities are putting in place supply side restrictions to new home development or new energy systems. Um, here in Vermont, it's a, it's a fight we lost, but you know, we were kind of at the end of the pipeline of natural gas into Vermont. And we tried to say, natural gas is no longer the transition fuel right? We have to stop the new pipelines coming into Vermont or through Vermont. We have to stop the big transmission lines coming from Hydro-Quebec into Vermont or through Vermont, right? We have to constrain the supply in order to shape the demand. So, I mean, that's one way as an economist that I would answer, give supply side restrictions a chance. Um, democratic voice is a really good way to lead to supply side restrictions, right? Because when we pull together diverse people from diverse backgrounds, diverse stakes, they want to change the conditions from which the economy emerges, right? Um, another way I often think about this, this is through a classic article that influenced me during my years in, in school uh, by a, a, a Cornell economist, a 1966 article by Alfred Kahn called The Tyranny of Small Decisions. Um, Khan went on to be one of the principal economic advisors to the Carter administration. So he didn't get very far with his, his advice. But um, he saw the market system, right, as this kind of tyranny. When we all go out and make individual decisions, the cost-benefit framework works beautifully, right? My decision to drive to work, my decision to buy a house, my decision to subdivide a farm into households, my decision to add another lane to a highway, that individual decision, it's really easy to say the benefits are greater than the costs. But the collection of all those individual decisions then end up in a kind of tyranny. This is the point that the individual decision makers never would have voted for. This requires um, to reorient our thinking of economics and economies towards collective action. Right? And collective action, in my story, can happen instantly through voting on the supply side and slowly and not fast enough through demand side incentives. 
don't know if I just made any sense because I was trying to weave together a couple, a couple of different thoughts. Maybe I have COVID, Bengi, and you you don't. <laughs> my, my, well, my, yeah, I, this, if this is Bengi on COVID, man, holy moly, I want to see Bengi. Like... <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if Bengi has a, uh, wants to answer that question or. Uh, no, I think that was amazing. But I think, like, to be fair, John, I think the questions are so kind of both inspired, large and inspired. Yeah, I love They're great questions. Don't, I do don't have, have kind of hard. Yeah, thank you so much, Bengi. Uh, I do have somebody who's almost like asking a clarification. We would talk a lot about growth, Rosen is, is saying, and are we talking about monetary growth, developmental growth, population growth? Hmm. How do we think about all these different types of growth? Uh, another easy question for sure. Well, I mean, in ecological economics, we talk about growth of throughput. So that's the technical way of thinking about it, right? So it's really low entropy energy going to high entropy waste. And I think that's a nice frame. <laughs> Because if you talk about growth in population, growth in consumption, growth in lifestyles, growth in development, all these kinds of growth, if it results in more throughput, not less, then it's the kind of growth that um, converts low entropy matter energy to high entropy waste. So that's a kind of technical version that you'll hear more from, uh, I think, Josh, maybe tomorrow on this kind of throughput growth. And it's, it's insane for me to imagine models of development that incentivize throughput growth and that's what we're talking about now the economics answer to that has been efficiency oh but well, we can still have outputs but be more efficient right but this is the green growth critique that we haven't really got into if efficient growth leads to more growth right which is the research by by uh callus and the barcelona folks are really this kind of rich empirical critique of green growth to say at the unit level, at the next thing, at the next decision piece, and this is the tyranny of small decisions again, we can show quite convincingly that growth has become more efficient. Each new unit requires more, less energy, less CO2, less labor, but we end up with more units and we're right back to where we started from, or even worse, worse the addiction to growth is even more entrenched through green growth than to say enough already. <laughs> It's the, the, the climate doesn't care if we become more efficient at the margin. The climate only cares if, if at the absolute amount of CO2 is less or more. The absolute amount of greenhouse gases is less or more. The rate of impact of human lifestyles is less or more. So if you got anything from today, really think about that distinction between, Bengi was really critiquing this model of the individual, which is ultimately a critique of, of the model of individual marginal choice, right? Versus, versus a, a future that's gonna require more collective action and more collective restraint on the economic enterprise in order to end up with a future that's viable, livable, and maybe more joy, joyful. I might give uh, Bengi a last word here and Chris Makaro is asking, do you think it's possible to get corporations on board with degrowth or steady state economics? without any corporate interest on board, this seems like an uphill battle. I know I'm giving you the, the easiest question, but. <laughs> <laughs> Go I'm gonna say no and then end the conversation here. No, it's funny because it's uh, one of the, I'm gonna start with, uh, with an anecdote. One of the kind of big kind of construction, corp, uh, construction companies in Turkey that was like very implicit in many kind of urban crimes, like crimes and kind of illegal, semi-legal, very close to the government, just like bulldoze off um, neighborhoods to like to, to build up um, malls and like residences, whatever, um, invited me to, to on a panel on degrowth, like they, they organized a, a panel on degrowth. And, and I, so it's, I think it points to the fact that um, corporations will start greenwashing degrowth as well. Um, and I think like my perspective of degrowth, as I said, I am a degrowth communist more than kind of a degrowth. And I don't understand degrowth as a technical matter of just uh, scaling down. I, I see it as a 
as kind of a change in how we make decisions, how we live together, and along which principles we organize our, our decisions towards. So for me, degrowth is not compatible with corporate capitalism, um, which kind of raises the question, how do we go about degrowth within corporate capitalism? I think someone brought it up in the, in the comments uh, there are many non-reformist reforms we can pursue to kind of that it would enable us to do more later. But so my short answer is that I mean it is possible to change things without getting corporate corporations on board, but that would mean fight and that would mean struggle. And that's not gonna kind of that's not gonna happen kind of in kind of under behind closed doors it's going to happen by kind of grassroots organizing and kind of building also kind of grassroots organizing to push for change but also grassroots organizing to build our autonomous basis of what i call social reproduction like economies of needs that we don't kind of rely on these structures that we're trying to change but that we have kind of autonomous basis of material social reproduction that we kind of um, that we can be self-sufficient with. Um, and because for me, degrowth is kind of not, you know, it's based on kind of self-governance and self-defining of how we are going to live together. And it's based on an economy, not based on corporate profits, but based on sufficiency and, and kind of affluence through sufficiency. So that's kind of my, my answer, I guess. Well, I really appreciate uh, this great discussion and, and Bengi was still like very grateful that you were able to join us uh, with COVID. That, that means a lot to, to all of us and I'm sure to the, to the participants. And thank you, John, for, for your presentation. I see a lot of great positive comments from all of you uh, participating. I, I would just like to, to tell you that tomorrow we are gonna be uh, learning about the biophysical and social foundations for a new economic story with Lisi Kral and Josh Farley. And so I really, really encourage you to do the, look at, check out the, the video, the, the pre-recordings that they, they made and, and the readings. I think they will help you to understand better what, what they will be discussing and get ready for questions and discussion tomorrow again. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. So Thanks, Rigo, for everything. Yeah, great job, Rigo. Super impressive that you pulled all this together. <laughs> Way to go, man. Let's all right, we'll see you both tomorrow. Yeah, see you guys. Let's... Oh, by the way, um... For those who are still here, if you have any issues with Slack, let me know. Uh, I know there, there's been some questions about it, but please try to use Slack as much as you can. And um, yeah, continue the, the discussion there and, and, and use the website as much as you can. Thank you.